Welcome to Light and Shadow. I'm your host, Maya Washington. It's time to bring some inspirational sports stories out of the shadows and into the light. Welcome, welcome to our inaugural episode. Uh, Today, we have a really special treat for you, Um, Jean Washington, the stellar wide receiver who happens to be my father. Uh, Jean Washington grew up under racial segregation in LaPorte, Texas, and was recruited to play football and run track at Michigan State University during the peak of the Civil Rights Movement, where he became a member of the first fully integrated college football team in America, through Duffy Doherty's recruitment pipeline, known as the Underground Railroad of College Football. Jean is an inducted member of the College Football Hall of Fame and the Michigan State University Athletics Hall of Fame, and he was also voted one of the 50 greatest Minnesota Vikings of all time. Welcome, Jean, Dad. I'm happy to be here. Happy to. Uh, I, I, I love that introduction that you just presented. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you for uh, taking some time out of your regularly scheduled COVID-19 uh, shelter-in-place activities uh, to, to talk to me today. And um, one thing I, I just wanted to start off with is you have a mantra that I have to say has become very inspirational for me and, and, and something I actually uh, spend time with for myself every day. Um, so something I recall you starting to say probably in the past five years, I, I, I've heard this more, you say every day is a gift. So tell me where that came from and what you mean when you say every day is a gift. It's, it's just a feeling that I have every, I was having every every morning uh, that I wake up every morning and and it just came to me that uh, that it was a gift. It is a gift to to be able to uh, to wake up every morning, and uh, and of course uh, the day every day is a gift, and just just became a part of a part of me. And I, you know, you welcome people and you say how are you doing, and and whenever they say how am I doing, I would always say that every day is a gift, and I'm just so happy just to be here, and so. Uh, that is just something that uh, that has become a part of me, and just to say that, and, and it's a special blessing. And so it's very it's very easy for me to say that, and I, I I'm just so glad to still be around. I'm I'm glad to have you around, Dad. Give us a sense for those who've never experienced racial segregation, um, like myself, um, who who've grown up in a world where at least legally. Um, I'm not prohibited from attending a certain school or being in a certain uh, space, um, grocery store, a public restroom, things that maybe people in my generation and younger take for granted. Can you describe what it was like in LaPorte, Texas, growing up um, in the 50s? What I remember and what I'll always remember is that the just a physical separation for us and for me to be separate, so separated from the white race, and uh, we were completely uh, in a separate situation. Our school, <clears throat> our school situation, uh, where we lived on the north side, which is uh, completely separated from the south, from from the other side of town, which was only exclusively for whites. Uh, our church situation, all of our masses, uh, all of the churches was completely separate and segregated, if you will. And so everything that in a daily life that we we just did not have any exposures to to white people because of the um, because of the segregation. And it was at that time, and it was at that time a, a state law, if you will. Uh, supported by the state legislature and the governor. So in all of the school systems, the independent school districts, which was an important independent school district. And and so when you're com- completely in a segregated situation, it's one of those, those things that uh, 
you, you just don't have a good feeling about the quote future. And and when I say future, you kind of you kind of ask yourself, and I did many times when I was growing up, what will be next? Uh, and when I say what will be next, how much longer would I, do I have to live in that particular situation? The community really looked out for your everyone, right? That that you looked out for your classmates and, and your teachers and everyone really seemed to have concern for one another. Can you talk about how getting to George Washington Carver High School um, continued that spirit for you and how you connected with Bubba Smith, uh, who ultimately played a really important role in your life after high school? Well, uh, what happened was that I was bused to George Washington Carver High School over in Baytown. And uh, at that time, they had a black school, uh, high school, for all the black students in the area. And uh, since uh, Laporte did not have a, a high school for the black students, uh, I believe there were about 15, 16, maybe 17 of us that was going into the ninth grade, and there were some others who were already on the 10th, 11th, and 12th. So that was about 15, maybe 30 students totally. So we were bused over to Baytown, which was about 15, 20 miles away, uh, one way. And uh, that is when I started playing uh, uh, in sports. And so by playing in sports, starting in the ninth grade, uh, ninth through twelfth grade, uh, <clears throat> the football and also the you know, the track and the and, and the and the and the basketball and baseball, and all of the coaches had to bring me back home after practice because uh, the buses that would take us back to Laporte uh, would leave about two o'clock going back to Laporte. So, so the coaches told, especially starting with my football coach, they told my 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 dad that. For me to play football, he would be happy to bring bring me home after practice. So all of my my competition, I got to know the coaches very well because they brought me home after all these practices back to Laporte. So in in in, in that regard, I got a chance to compete against Bubba, especially in football and basketball. And so we we developed a friendship. I knew him and I knew his dad and everything. And so after our senior year, Bubba did come to me and tell me that uh, that he was going to, he was going to uh, he was going to Michigan State. Uh, he really wanted to go to Texas, but University of Texas, but that couldn't happen because he wasn't integrated, and they were not taking any black students. So he he, he he promised and said that he would put a good word in for me with Duffy and er, encourage him to also uh, bring me up. Uh, to Michigan State also. Now he did that, and and of course uh, uh, I I I I ended up running track mainly mainly because Bubba knew that I ran track and all. And from a football standpoint, uh, they didn't have any more football scholarships left. I think it was only some track scholarships, and the track team and the coaches were trying to find some track. Uh, athletes and and so Duffy did he was the athletic director Biggie Wolfman and Professor and Towns track coaches and and they agreed to give me to give me one of those scholarships and Bubba and his father Bubba's father of course was a football coach uh, they had impressed upon Duffy that uh, I ran the hurdles and I ran track and I could make it a, a good contribution and so I, that's how I was able to to get that. Uh, that football, that well, that scholarships to go to Michigan State. So you had an amazing career at Michigan State, and um, I would argue were on one of the best Michigan State uh, University football teams uh, ever. Uh, you all won uh, two national titles. Um, you also were Big Ten champions uh, two years in a row, but you're track career I know is something you're really proud of and 
um, outside of those people who really know um, track and what you accomplished, um, I just want to highlight um, that you have two outdoor and one indoor Big Ten track titles. Um, you have one Central Collegiate Conference uh, Championship. Um, so you have, um, you know, records, NCAA records to this day um, in high hurdles and have really been cemented in history as a world-class hurdler. Um, you achieved All-America, All-Big Ten, uh, Academic All-America honors um, in football, as well as both indoor and outdoor track. So your time at Michigan State uh, was you, – you, your schedule must have been filled from morning to, <laughs> morning to night um, between mm -hmm. athletics and your education. So for any student athletes who might be listening, um, how did you pull that off? Well, what, what, what was most important to me, as, as I think back, uh, it all started back in that uh, single room school in Laporte when Mrs. Evans was, was was our teacher, and being in that in that family situation, and being in the middle of uh, segregation the way that we were segregated against. So, Dad, I remember a few years ago we had a chance to go to Laporte um, to uh, visit some of the places where you grew up, um, including the Laporte Colored School, which was the first school for uh, black children in your community. And uh, the thing that really took me aback was it, it was literally, a, it is a one-room schoolhouse. That really gave me that inspiration and motivation to do my do the best I could. And so that that was always uppermost in my mind, doing my best and making sure that uh, that I I held up my part of the part of the understanding that I was going to do my very best to be a good athlete and also to be a good student. Well, I think what's also so remarkable that you were able to achieve both your academic uh, goals and uh, achieve pretty much the pinnacle of, of collegiate success uh, as an athlete is that you and others uh, were part of creating and shaping history, that the number of African-American uh, players on Duffy Doherty's uh, national championship teams as well as the number of African-Americans who were uh, running and excelling in track at Michigan State at that time. Um, you made a really significant contribution in terms of the representation of people of color at the collegiate level. So tell me about how the president of Michigan State, John Hanna, was really um, instrumental in making those kinds of shifts at Michigan State but how they ultimately impacted the rest of America, um, including Duffy Doherty's efforts to recruit Pacific Islanders um, in Hawaii. How did John Hanna's leadership um, make such an impact on history from your perspective? Yeah. I, I, I would say that Duffy Doherty, of course, Duffy, uh, it all started with Duffy because she was putting on coaching clinics down there and the, in our area of Houston and Beaumont and Port Arthur, the whole area down there and other places around the country. So what what I remember, and when I say Duffy started it all, is that he, Duffy and Coach Smith, Bubba's father, were very very close. And so when I and so when Duffy would put on those coaching clinics, uh, Coach Willie Ray Smith, Bubba's father, was always very much involved with the ones and a part of the one that was in Texas. And Duffy did the same thing in North Carolina and all of those southern states because the, the black coaches, uh, because of segregation, they had to have separate coaching clinics. So Duffy not only did his visits with the black coaches, but he also visited the white coaches. So, so he would spend uh, a week, if he was down in Texas a week, he would go to all the... Uh, the coaching sessions for all of the black coaches and also coaching sessions for all of the white coaches. 
And so it all started with Duffy, and of course he had to he had the support of Biggie Mon, our athletic director, and most importantly he had the support from uh, President Hanna. And uh, and of course uh, the three of them were, were really on on the same page in terms of being fair in that whole civil rights uh, movement. Uh, so when I think back about President Hanna, uh, not only was he the first uh, civil rights commissioner and he was appointed by President Eisenhower, but most importantly, at, at Michigan State, when he came to Michigan State, when he took on the assignment at Michigan State as our president, uh, he right away, immediately, when he came in, he integrated the uh, our whole housing system, and and this is something that I I learned by later on because when I went to Michigan State, everything was all integrated. But for years before President Hanna came, everything was completely segregated, and he did that early on. When at a time in the '60s, there were still a lot of schools across the country, in the north and the south had segregated residential hall program, halls programs. And so it was very easy uh, for, for, for Duffy to be a, a support uh, to bring in, to recruit all of us from the South and from different states when a lot of my teammates, uh, like, like, like uh, George Webster, of course, is from Anderson, South Carolina, and Jimmy Ray, Fayetteville, North Carolina. So there's a lot of there's a lot of guys and who were recruited up to Michigan State. Duffy was very instrumental in making it happen, and of course he was supported by Biggie Mon, and also especially President Hanna. And and Biggie Mon, in terms of he won a national championship, and and the team was completely integrated. And that was again at a time where where black Players could not play in the South. All of the southern, uh, all of the southern uh, places down down south. When I was played, and before I, I went to Michigan State, it was all segregated. And Big and Duffy and and uh, President Hanna, uh, they were all, always on board about the civil rights and being fair and representing uh, our whole country. I think you're really. Um right in, in sort of pointing out that uh, Michigan State, you know, had African-American representation um, w while you were still in high school, right? A lot of, a lot of the, the recruiting explosion kind of happened with your um, freshman class of 1963, that incoming class. But can you talk about um, Sherman Lewis and some of the other African-American players uh, who were on varsity uh, when you were being recruited and how how significant their contributions were when uh, the school didn't have the numbers, right, that it did by the time you got there. So can you talk yeah. about how, how those um, players who preceded you really did a lot to pave the way and, and make it possible for you all to be as successful as you were? Yeah. Well, one, one, one of the things I remember, Sherman, 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 Sherman Lewis was from Louisville, Kentucky, and he was our half, right, halfback. And then we had we had a number of uh, black players from the from the South who were up there. But when I came in as a, in my freshman year, our freshman year, of course, we could not play on the varsity. We could not play. Uh, freshman could not play, and he could only play that sophomore, junior, senior year. So our freshman year, the, the, what I remember most is uh, the, the scrimmages and the workouts we had preparing the team for those Saturday afternoons. As a freshman, we couldn't play, see? And so, so during the week, we would uh, pretend that we are to play like we're the team that they are to play. Mm -hmm. On that coming Saturday, so so we, we did all we we did all we could to prepare them, and because we had so so such outstanding talent among our group, 
that Duffy had to be uh, careful because uh, it was quite a challenge for us to get them ready and scrimmage and all of that. And he really had to cut short some of those scrimmages we used to have against the uh, players that, who we had to get ready for that Saturday, see? Mm-hmm. And we were all freshmen. So so one one of the things I really remember with that whole situation, that new situation after leaving Texas and going into this completely integrated situation, the whole idea about segregation and being separated from each other. Mm-hmm. We we never had we never had discussions and everybody had their assignments and and of course Duffy we everybody had, had respect for Duffy and Big and 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 we we didn't get into situations and, and while all of this was going around down south of the civil rights moving movement recognizing what Dr. Martin Luther King was so much so much involved with it never registered to us. Or we never, we never got upset with each other. It was just that we had classes to attend, we had uh, papers to do, and we had practices and all of that. And we were just one big family. Um, from some of the stories I've heard from some of the guys about, um, you know, traveling um, and, and sort of how things went for integrated teams. Um, you know, being able to travel interstate and that sort of thing or dating and that's those concerns that come up um, when I get to see you spend time with all of your teammates, Black, um, White, Pacific Islander, everyone um, together, I I definitely feel like I, I see that big family. Um, so before we uh, wrap this up, I think one of the really exciting things that um, lives in history um, in your career and your time at Michigan State, and, and certainly uh, puts Michigan State on the map, is that in the 1967 uh, draft, you were a first-round draft pick, but also from Michigan State, um, Bubba Smith, Clinton Jones, and George Webster, all of you were um, drafted within the first eight picks in the first round, something that had never occurred in history, <laughs> hasn't occurred yeah. since. And um, remarkably, all of you are African American. Um, you had a, a, a great playing career at the at the Vikings. Um, you were able to be part of um, what is arguably one of the best Minnesota Vikings teams. So you got kind of team lucky, um, <laughs> where uh, yeah. you were on the Vikings team that. Um, won three Central Division titles and the 1969 National Football League Championship and, and also um, were able to go to a Super Bowl during your, your time um, at the Vikings. So for uh, young athletes today um, and uh, those who are fans, right, um, we're not sure what, what the free agency and the draft hold um, this spring or what um, football season holds, uh, for us in the in the fall. Um, so thinking back to that time for you, if you can remember the spring of 1967 when you were uh, drafted and, and getting ready for camp and, and, and starting your new life, um, what was going through your mind at that time? Um, did you have any idea that you would have the success in the NFL that, that you ultimately did have? Well, uh, I guess to to respond to that, the one one of the things I have to keep in mind uh, at the time we we just did not have the the smartphones and cell phones and the instant media, if you will, because when we were drafted, when the four of us, uh, Bubba of course went to Baltimore, and then there was Clinton that went to Minnesota. And then, of course, uh, George went to uh, George Webster went to uh, the University of Houston, and not the University of Houston. I'm sorry, the Houston Oilers at the time. And then, of course, I went to Minnesota. You have to also keep in mind when you have uh, four black athletes who football players who are drafted within the eight first eight picks. That came at a time when it was a big question mark. 
on why, for example, are you drafting these guys in the first round as the first picks? Because everything was still segregated. When all of this happened, everything was still segregated down south. Mississippi, Alabama, all of those southern schools, when that draft came out, they were still segregated. And around the country, the only recognition we got, you had to be from the north, if you will. And so that, as I look back on that, was kind of on my mind because uh, uh, when I think about the uh, Minnesota Vikings and, 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 and Bud Grant, our coach, he, he, he even mentioned to me personally that Gene uh, uh, drafting uh, Clinton number one and and Alan Page and, and all of us black players coming to Minnesota, he was uh, he was asked about that. Now this is 1967 when all of that happened. See, and so uh, you know at the time I didn't think anything about that because I was just glad to have an opportunity. But around the country in the 1967, we were still having some concerns in terms of black players and having an opportunity to play in the National Football League. And one of the things that uh, I, I'm so proud that the Big Ten Conference uh, embraced us, and we had an opportunity to play at Michigan State. Uh, the University of Minnesota, you know, Carl Eller and Sandy Stevens, and of course they had some black players at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, so all, all of that in terms of it all goes back to having an opportunity, and that's all that we wanted was to have an opportunity. We had an opportunity to play at Michigan State. All of us played together. And as I've said many times, it was, a, it was really, really a team effort. Uh, the black players, the white players, we, we all played as a family, and we all supported each other. And, and there was never, never an issue. One of the things that I will always remember is that my sophomore year, our sophomore year, we played at the University of North Carolina. The University of North Carolina, we we played on their in their in their field there, and we played at a time where the University of North Carolina, at the time we played, black students they were not accepting any black students. Of course, we played against an all-white team at that time. Okay, so I didn't hear about that until years later. Once again, it wasn't a big to-do. or uh, It was a lot of fanfare about the fact that we were playing a completely segregated Southern team mm -hmm. because of the news and because of the cell phones and quickness of sports, but but I learned later on that that school, given us that opportunity, was completely segregated. And added to that, Duffy Doherty, Big Iman, President Hanna, there was no mention of the fact that the University of North Carolina was completely a white school. Mm -hmm. And here's Michigan State, we we flying into the, on their campus. I had never been to North Carolina. We had no problems whatsoever. We played the game and all of that. But this is what uh, what I remember is about Michigan State. It wasn't a lot of fanfare. We were all in this together. We were part of our country. We were playing football. And on that one occasion in my college football career that we played a southern school, at a time where the South and North Carolina was completely segregated. And here are our team at the time, half of us are black players. <laughs> it's it's remarkable. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, all this history that you're a part of, and at the time you're just sort of living life and, and trying to um, make life work on your terms based on the experiences that you were having. Can you talk about, um, obviously, salaries were very different in those days. Um, we weren't seeing the million-dollar contracts 
uh, that NFL players might be negotiating this spring. Um, can you talk about what salaries were like and how you personally um, made ends meet for yourself um, to take care of your family and why um, it was necessary for players to have work <laughs> outside of football to sustain them? Um, you know, in, in regard to that, the uh, the salaries at the time, you know, we we were just so happy to get any kinds of dollars. <laughs> uh, and so the idea of the salaries they have now, you know, that that was uh, uh, we could never we could never believe that we are where we are now. But in the meantime, uh, all I can say is that. From the salaries that that I was making at the time, it was such that I had to work in the off season. I had to work during the season, and and I was fortunate to to uh, to go back to East Lansing every year and worked in the college placement center, uh, helping students find employment and coaching students in terms of interviewing for jobs. And I was able to do that and then do my graduate work while I was doing that. And during the season, uh, I also worked at the 3M company. I worked at the Dayton Hutchins Corporation in the, uh, uh, the department stores, but mostly, but mostly 3M. So, yes, I worked in the morning before practice and played football on the weekend. And I was back in the office uh, that uh that Monday, especially on Mondays, which was our day off. So, so I was doing the human resources. I was working in human resources at the time. So, uh, looking at the complete salary situation, it was a situation where, where I had to, and I thought that I had to make sure that if I couldn't play football, I would have something to fall back on. So, so when I worked at 3M and when I worked at uh, Dayton's department stores, I was working in human resources, which was uh, uh, very similar to I was trying to, I was representing the company and trying to hire the best of the best and engineers. And, and when I was at, at Michigan State, I was trying to help students find employment. So I had, I had a nice situation of working and helping students find employment, and then, of course, in hiring the best of the best to come to work at 3M, for example. Mm -hmm. And so that worked out real well, and I was able to uh, to really take care of the family because you never you never know in terms of the injury standpoint. And then, of course, on the education part, I was able to uh, take some graduate courses and complete my graduate work. And so, so when it came time that, I, unfortunately, I was injured, couldn't play anymore. I at least I had something to fall back on to to take care of the family and to make 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 it nice for 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 you and Lisa and Gina. <laughs> All of your sacrifices, Dad. I think you know in this journey that we've been on with the film and um, getting closer together um, through this history and through football um, has been a great blessing. And then, so I really really appreciate. It as your daughter, your sacrifices, and your contribution. Um, but hopefully those listening who, who don't know a lot of um, the history of the early NFL or the um, contributions that your generation made, and I say your generation, I'm saying those players who are, um, we'll just say like 65 and up, um, who really built the league, and I'm so honored and grateful to be your daughter and to have been given this opportunity um, through through the banks of the Red Cedar and the time mm -hmm. that we spent together the past few years in mm -hmm. um, getting to know more more about this and, and more about you. Um, so as people think about um, life in this kind of challenging time that we're in where um, – People are trying to protect themselves, protect their families, but also keep their spirits up. Can we circle back to your mantra, every day is a gift? And um, can you maybe share one thing that, that you are doing that's keeping yourself 
in a positive state of mind, um, allowing you to stay connected maybe to your own athleticism <laughs> while you're, you know, locked indoors um, and there's not any original sports on, on, on television or streaming right now. Um, what is helping you remember that every day is a gift during this time? I, I, I think that the, uh, I think that trying to keep sanity, if you will, challenges, the challenge for me is that, as you know, I, I, I love working out and, and running and all of those things. I can't do that anymore. So I'm locked, a lot, a lot then. One of, the, one of the things that uh, that I, I I do and try to do is to make sure that uh, I have a good book uh, to, to read, if you will. And uh, there are some catching up that I'm catching up on on some some books that I'm, that, I, that 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 I'm reading and and and. and there are some puzzles that uh, that we have here too. Try to keep in mind as as active as you can, but in the meantime, I'm also enjoying the fact that I'm looking at all of these old movies on TV and all of these uh, uh, these football prior football events. So there's a lot of things to keep you busy, but the most important thing is that. Uh, I find myself walking more. Years ago, I used to run a lot, so I'm I'm, I'm walking up and down stairs a little bit more. And uh, I'm not outside, so I'm walking to the building. So, so I got I have a few things just keep me busy. Good. Well, I am so grateful that you spent this time with me. Um, grateful for all of your sacrifices and your contributions. And uh, thank you so much for your time, Dad. Well, thank you for the for spending some time with me. <laughs> and to all of our listeners, um, if you like this, uh, we're going to do more of this. So like, subscribe, share, and we'll continue to bring you some great content and interviews about uh, athleticism, about history and how we can stay connected through sports and uh, being active. So thank you all. Tune in next time. 